Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's really great to be back, and we're going to continue with this wonderful series that Pastor wrote, The Timeless Ten, The Commandments. We've been on a journey for probably the past eight weeks now. We're getting to right now where we're about ready to end. Today we will be talking about the last two commandments. But before we do that, I thought we might just take a moment to sort of see where this journey has gone. And it starts with the uh, commandments themselves. We shall have no other gods, first commandment. We learned in that commandment that there is only one true God in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it's the God that we always should adore and have no other gods before us. And then we shall not misuse the name of the Lord. We all know about that one. We're not supposed to slander, use satanic art, any of that kind of thing. Only use God's name in calling out for the good that he can do. And then he asks, remember the Sabbath. That's what we're here to do today. And the Lord rested on the seventh day, and so are we to take time every week to just not worry about all the things that we worry about the other six days of the week and just relax and give thanks to him for all that he has given us. Those are the first three commandments all about your relationship with God. And then we have the balance of the commandments, which are what? and therefore our relationships with each other. And it starts with number four, of course. Remember, as, as the boy said, honor your father and your mother. Great commandment, but that's also about honoring and respecting all authority because God has given authority to everyone in their various jobs. It's about that. And then we get into what I would like to call the action commandments, the ones that we, things we do against our neighbor. You shall not murder. Not only just the normal term murder, we understand that, but it also takes in things like suicide and abortion and, or destroying the character of a person, all forms of murder. And then we should not commit adultery. We know about that one, and that has to do with all of the various things that have to do with sins of the flesh, not just the term adultery. And then, of course, we have you should not steal. Obviously, that one's pretty easy, one that we have to be careful of, and there's all kinds of stealing. And last week, of course, we talked about false testimony, which is perjury in the legal sense, but we also talked about the little white lie, did we not? An exaggeration and gossiping, all the things that go into that commandment. And today, of course, we're going to bring the last two in, but before we do that, uh, not yet on that screen, thank you. But <laughs> um, God himself, when he preached, rasped up all those commandments, did he not? We talked about that last week too. He said, love your God with your whole heart, your whole mind, and your whole soul, the number three. And then the last, uh, last seven are, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So that brings us to today. We're going to do commandments nine and ten, which... To many people say these are two of the toughest commandments because these commandments are tough because it's talking about what? It's talking about what's in your heart and what's in your mind. The things that nobody else can see. All those things that are deep down inside you. The things that you really want and the things that you want to see happen and the things that you obsess about and the things that you try to get. Things nobody else knows about except you. That's called coveting. And scripture says, we shall not covet. Coveting, of course, as it says on our board there, is the desire for something that belongs to someone else or your neighbor. We do this, don't we? We think about how we can get things that aren't ours. We lust over things that are not ours. It's, a, it's that craving we have to want more. To want more. Greed. The ninth commandment then actually says, 
Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house. Now, what does that mean? Well, Martin Luther wrote it for us. Let's all read that together. We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance, our house, or get it in a way which only appears right, but to help be of service to people. That's an interesting, interesting way he puts it. You know, Martin Luther always does that in his answers. He first tells us what we shouldn't do, and then he winds it up about what we should do. It's that scheming. That's what this is about. It's about how can I get what I want from my neighbor? How can I get what I want from my boss? How can I get what I want from anything or anybody? How do I get it? Scary. We want more. We're not satisfied. We're not content. Let me give you a, purely a hypothetical, though. Let's say there's a beautiful house. I think we had a picture up there before. Beautiful house that we want. So we start thinking, how can I, I can't afford that house. How could we get it? I know. Let's, let's start some rumors that the government's going to build a prison nearby. And all kinds of people undesirable will probably move into the neighborhood. That should drive the price down. Evil scheme. Evil scheme. That's already a sin. Whether you ever do really do that or not is immaterial. But you're scheming to get something that doesn't belong to you. Instead, God says you're supposed to defend your neighbor and help him keep what he's got, not try to take what he has. Then we get to the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Let's read that. You should not covet your neighbor's wife, or manservant, maidservant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs. And again, Martin Luther will give us, what does that mean? We should fear and love God. Right, there we go again. Now, it's much like the Ninth Commandment, of course, except for now, we're not talking about the Ninth Commandment. It was really talking about taking possessions, things of value, things, even money, okay? And we heard in our reading today where Paul wrote, what, for the love of money, okay? We know about that one. Is the source of all kinds of evil, and those that do it risk losing their faith. But the 10th commandment is not about personal gain for money. It's about person. It's about lust. It's about envy. It's about things for me. The best example I can think of is, of course, King David, right? We all know that story. King David comes out on his balcony and looks down, and there's this beautiful woman, woman down below, sunbathing naked, and he lusts for her in his head already, and then schemes. And once he schemes, he actually goes on and then commits the sin, the, the sin of action. And that's the risk. That's what God did these two commandments. He wanted to let us know the real dangers of what goes on up here and in here. Not what you and I see of each other, but what is in here. And he wanted you to know that those dangers of what you're thinking can be the dangers that lead to damnation. Sort of a scary thing, I know. And somebody said, well, are you trying to say that coveting and, and, and wishing for things is always wrong? Well, of course not. Of course not. God doesn't say you can't think in your head and, and want certain things and want to improve your life or to be better for your family. Of course not. Those are things we all want. But we can't go about them in a devious way. We can't take from someone else to get what we want. Coveting is, is really a, it's a thing of the heart. And coveting is a strong desire and emotion that, that really can get us into trouble whether we want it to or not. It may even drive us to get something we want so bad that we do do the evil things to get it. 
Now, God didn't want that. He wants us to covet, yes. But how about coveting his righteousness? How about coveting the things that are good in life? That's fine. That's where we should be at. But it's going to be difficult. Why? Our whole world is a sinful world. This is Satan's ground that we're on. This is the place where we really live. Look at your TV or your news magazines or your internet and the advertisements. What are all those things doing? They're tempting you to covet. They're saying, you've got to have this new 80-inch TV. You've got to have a Mercedes because your Chevy's not good enough. You've got to have a big house. It's all about greed and us wanting more. They feed on that. They feed us that, and we fall for that trap. And it gets sort of scary because usually once we obtain some of those things, what do we do? Eh, we want some more. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're never satisfied. We're never content. We just can't sit back and enjoy what God has given us. And after all, that's what contentment is. Contentment is, well, what did Paul say? She's just put that up there. Now that Paul... When he was with the Philippians, or, yeah, he had come back. They had, they had always supported him, and they didn't support him for a while because they couldn't. But he came back, and he started preaching, and they were going about to give him some more money so he could continue preaching and doing his thing. And he said, not that I am speaking of need, for I have learned that in whatever situation I am, I am content. Paul had learned the hard way. Paul had quite a life, as we all know. Started out pretty bad, right? Persecuting the church, and now he's this magnificent leader of the church. He'd been at all. He'd been high, he'd been low, he had abundance, he had been poor. And he learned that in the contentment of God, knowing that God was within him, in his heart, and in his mind, he could do all things. He knew that contentment, discontentment, would lead to the horizontal way we lived of lusting and looking for things around us, material things, knowing that that could never satisfy. And he knew that when he looked vertically to God, to the cross, he understood that that fulfilled everything that he needed. We know Jesus did what? Jesus sent the 12 out, did he not? And he told them, don't take anything with you, just go. God will take care of everything. Contentment. What does content mean? What did I say, wrong? What does, what does I, what does that say up there? What does it mean to be content? Well, we've talked about that. I got a story for you about contentment. Sort of an interesting little thing. Uh, it's hypothetical, of course. <clears throat> There's a guy named Rich, easy name for me to remember. Um, and Rich, was, Rich really looked at this neighbor's lawn across the street that was absolutely perfect, beautifully manicured, and said, boy, I really want that for me and for my house. But his lawn was full of dandelions. So he reseeded. He rewatered a lot of water to see if that had helped. That didn't help. He took water away, and that didn't help. He just was beside himself. He put poison on. That didn't help. More dandelions grew. But Rich, being a smart guy, he went to the nursery in town, the big nursery, asked for the head gardener, brought him out. He said, look, it, I've got this terrible lawn. This is all the stuff I've done. I don't know what to do anymore. What can I do? And the gardener said, learn to like dandelions. Yeah, be content with what you have, <laughs> not what you want <laughs> or what you think you want, because usually that doesn't work anyway. Contentment. Is there, what's the next slide? This is also from Paul. It continues with the idea of contentment, and he continued in his talk with the Philippians, and he said, I know both how to have a little and how to have a lot. And in any circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content. 
whether well-fed or hungry, whether abundant or in need, I am able to do all things through him who has strength. So where does this contentment reside? It resides in your heart. I think it says in Proverbs that a, a man in his heart plans his course. But it is God who takes the steps. It's in your heart where this all starts and where it all goes. Contentment, not an easy thing to get. Because contentment, like Paul just told us, is not something we get naturally. It's, it's not something we have. It's something we have to learn. It's something we have to work for to get. So I know you must be wondering, how do you get it? I know that's what I'd be asking. How the heck do you get that? Well, there's a, there's a basic formula that may work for some of you. There's four steps that I think you should always think about. The first one, of course, is the most important. Remember what Jesus has done for you. Jesus Christ asked for every one of your sins, and he took them, and he brought them to the tomb with him and buried them there so that you could be forgiven and those sins would be forgotten. And therefore, you now have a relationship. You can have a relationship with him. And you can have the salvation that he is offering. Eternity with him. Not the pleasures of this world. Eternity with him. What else do you need? What else could you possibly want? Second thing is... Let go of the past. Many of us have trouble doing that. Forget those sins that you have. Don't hear me wrong here. I'm not saying you should ignore the fact that you did wrong at some point. But forget the guilt. You have already been forgiven. What you must make sure you do in your own mind is be sure you admit that mistake and be sure that you give it to God. Hand it to him. He'll take it. And when he takes it, you're forgiven. And you can move on. Get rid of those sayings like, I should have, or if only I didn't do that, or wow, how could I have ever... Forget those terms anymore. Put that guilt behind you and move forward. Paul also said that I have put things in the past and I only look forward to the things of the future. The past is the past. Third, live day by day. Day by day. Don't worry about tomorrow. We've already gotten rid of the past. And that was in our gospel reading this morning too, I believe. Was it not? Okay, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Today is what you should worry about. And taking care of yourself today. And lastly, it is Jesus Christ is all you need. He said, seek the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all things will be given to you. That's all you need to know. You just need to know that Jesus Christ is in your heart and in your mind. And you will have contentment. You will reach the contented state. Today, I want you to think. I want you to all make a commitment just today. Make that commitment. That then this day forward, you are going to strive for that. You are going to try to be committed and have him in your heart. It's the timeless 10 that he's given you. That's what it's all about. That's why we've been doing this series. The timeless 10 are the things that help you to gain contentment because those are the things of the righteousness of Christ are all there. They're your guide. We talked about it. That's the curb that keeps you from wandering into the wilderness of where Satan lurks. It's the mirror that does show you where maybe you need to brush up and do a few things. And of course, as Christians, we accept that as the third use of the law 
and we use that as our guide for the rest of our lives, the guide that will lead us to him. Finally, the thing I want you to remember is just what's on the screen. He has given you every reason to be content. He went to the cross for you. He was buried in the tomb for you. He rose in the dead from you. And he asked that you be content and wait until he takes you home. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Ali. Peace.